Well, we got a lot, of co- lot to cover today, so I'm going to hopefully uh, be able to teach y'all something. I learned something by just re- reviewing the scriptures and studying some things, and, and so maybe both of us can learn today. Uh, of course, I've got a bunch of notes here, so we may get out by four, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to get you out a little earlier. Okay, we're going to dig deep. There's no milk today. It's all meat, okay? No coloring book Jesus. We're not going to do that today. You guys have been around here long enough. We're going to dig deeper into the scripture. And hopefully, we'll see some things that God wants us to learn today. All right? Uh, First things I'm going to cover uh, are just things that are applicable to your life. You know, we can learn things from the scripture, but if they don't apply to our lives, we go, oh, I don't need that stuff. Just like algebra, you know, how many of you took algebra? You know, oh, I never need that. Not you. I think you're the quantum physics. <laughs> I heard about you. You scare me already. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so today we're going to learn who you are. We're going to learn what are you doing here on this earth. We're going to learn how you're supposed to live on this earth, and we're going to learn how much, or get a pretty good idea about the time frame. How much time do we have here, okay, according to Scripture, okay? We're going to start out with who are you? Who are you? You are an eternal being. You know what eternal means? You don't die, okay? You were born on this earth. But God knew you before you were born, is what I'm saying. You are a soul, okay? If you are a born-again believer, you also have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, okay? But you are a soul as well as a body. Um, When I used to work in the fire department and the air traffic controllers and stuff at the tower, when they would have a plane coming in with emergencies, they would always give out specific information that would pop up on your data terminal about a plane coming in, landing gear problems, a plane coming in, engine problems or whatever. They'd say Delta 348 coming in on runway, blah, 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 with these particular problems. What would they always say, Justin? How many souls are on board? They would always give how many souls were on board. Not how many people, not how many human beings, but how many souls. Why would they always call it souls? And this is the secular world, okay? Keep that in mind. They would always refer to souls because in the cargo area, they might have, you know, some people's pets or whatever, goldfish, whatever. They don't have souls. Animals don't have souls. Humans are souls. There's a big difference. So they would announce how many souls are on board. That's who you are. You are a soul, okay? Again, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit as a believer, but you are a soul. I like, uh, y'all familiar with C.S. Lewis? Remember the, the author? and He used to be a uh, professor. Yeah, English. Was it English? Geneva? English professor? He was at Cambridge and Oxford. Anyway, all through his 20s, he was an atheist, okay? When he got to be 30 years old, he came to know the Lord. He became a Christian. And one of the things, where's Chris? Chris still here? Oh, one of the things that famous quotes from C.S. Lewis that I always really love, and it just really nailed things down uh, for me in a lot of ways, and Chris puts it on all of his emails at the bottom. It's by C.S. Lewis. He says, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Did y'all get that? You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Big difference, right? And as a believer, again, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Okay, you existed before you were on this earth. How do I know? Well, we look at the scriptures and we know. Psalm 139, 13, for you were formed in my inward parts. Oh, there you go. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Okay, so that tells you right there, God formed you, God created you, uh, and he knitted you together in your mother's womb. You are no accident. 
None of us in this room are an accident. Every one of us, God planned for us to be here. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5, listen to this very carefully. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Who is Jeremiah? Isn't he just a human like us? Isn't he? But yet God said, I knew you before you were here on earth. I knew you. Well, that applies to every one of you, including myself. God knew you before you were here. That gives a whole new meaning to your birthday, doesn't it? Right? When's your birthday? Well, I don't know. Nobody in this room knows when their birthday was because they were here before they were here. Or they were there before they were here. Right? Does it make sense? God placed you here. You're no accident. Okay. So we're starting to nail down who we are. <clears throat> Interesting thing to me as us being eternal beings is that we're going to be here on this earth for a predetermined amount of time, right? God already knows. He knows when we came. He knows when we're going to be checking out of this earth. It's predetermined. He already knows. But he doesn't share that information with us. I don't care how hard you pray on your knees and ask God, when is the last day I have on this earth? He ain't going to tell you. Just like he won't tell you the last day that this earth is going to exist. He won't tell you. I think he does that to protect us. How many of you would be a little nervous if you knew this was your last day? <laughs> it's like, oh, maybe I'll skip lunch today, <laughs> you know? Uh, but yeah, so we don't have a clue. It's a predetermined amount of time that only God knows. All right? So the next thing I want to talk about is what are we doing here? And this is where it really gets critical. What are we doing here? You were born, you grew up, you didn't get to pick what family you were in, you didn't get to pick whether you're, what race or ethnicity you are, you didn't get to pick what country you would grow up in. Nobody gets to pick that stuff. You don't get to pick if you're going to be, have a disability like blindness or, or you know, deafness or uh, paraplegic or what. You don't get to pick any of that stuff. People are born that way but remember there's no accidents if you are that person you are not an accident God intended that to be that way okay so we didn't have any choices it was God's design but I want to focus so clearly on the fact that there are no accidents and that there is nothing random to God Everything that happens in our life sometimes seems random, like, why did that happen? Or what? This, why am I going through this? Why am I going through that? But nothing in your life is random to God. It's all His plan. It's all His design. Whatever you're walking through at this time, I guarantee you, it's by God's design. Now, you go, man, that's kind of harsh, because sometimes I'm going through a lot of stuff, you know, and I don't like it, but that's God's design, Okay. So we're going to get to that a little further down the line. Uh, <clears throat> the important thing for you to remember is that no mistakes. God didn't make a mistake. Uh, it's not an accident that you're here and that we don't have the capacity to understand it yet. We just don't. That's a God thing. All right. We, have, we try to make plans. We try to do things and make plans. I'm going to do this. Or I'm going to do that. But as I tell our life group a lot of times, uh, if you want to tell God a funny joke, tell him your plans. You know, he'll get a kick out of that. Tell God your plans, right? These are my plans, Lord. And he's going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 through 13, for I know the plans I have for you. Did y'all get that? God's saying this. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Okay, so who's got the plan? You? Nope. Nope, no plan for you. God's got the plan. 
Are God's plans perfect? Yes. Isaiah 55, 9. Listen to this. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay. So our thoughts are not anything compared to God's thoughts. Y'all getting this? And his plan is his plan. It's not your plan. Okay? So before you think we're just floating around here on this planet in a random mess that has no form, no, that's the furthest thing from the truth. You are right there where God wants you to be right now at this very moment. And that, to me, as a human, is like, wow, that's kind of hard to accept. But when you look at the scripture, it's true. It's all true. That's what it really is. <clears throat> so, moving on. Y'all still with me? You got your helmet on? You strapped in? How are we supposed to live? Remember, we determined that nobody asked to be here. We didn't say, oh, I think I'm going to come to earth right now and be born into this family. No. That was all, all God. So how are we supposed to live while we're here? We know, based on other people that have gone before us, that they all die. Has anybody not died yet that, you know, that's 200 over, been on this earth 200 years? No, except for in the early days when, who was it, Methuselah lasted 900 and something. But those days are gone. Okay, so what are we supposed to do here? Do we just eat, drink, and wait till we die and sleep? Is that what we do? What's the point? In other words, why did God bring us to this place? Obviously, he did. But what are we doing here? What are we supposed to be about? What are we supposed to accomplish? Is there anything we're supposed to accomplish? What is all of this we call life on this planet? What is this? You can lay on your back in the grass and look up at the sky and you realize, I don't know what this place really is, but I'm here, you know. What am I doing here? I don't know. So let's, let's dissect it a little bit. Let's look at it. We don't know how long we're going to last here on this earth, but we know it's just temporary. Where are you going from here? If you're a believer, you're going to heaven to be with the Lord. If you're not, you go to other places. That's not what this lesson's about. But we can preach that too. All right, so we're here. He wants us to do something while we're here, and we're going to talk about that. And it was so important to Jesus that we accomplish these things on this earth that, that he gave us a huge list of things to do while we're here that he wants us to do. And he didn't call them suggestions. He called them commandments. This huge list that consists of two things. Okay? And it's in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. And this is the words from Holy God, the second part of the Trinity. This is Jesus' words. They asked him, his disciples said in verse 36, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Verse 39. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Okay. Pretty simple. Right? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus said to do while you're here. That's what he said. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. It's right here. That's what we're to be about. Okay. Some of this stuff, well, we're going to dissect it and look at it so that we can get a handle on what this really means. All right? How do you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind? How do you do that? What's the first thing you would do if somebody told you you need to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, what would you do first? I would say spend time with him. How do you do that? Prayer. You got to pray. 
It's so important that you pray, okay? You have to spend time with somebody and communicate with them for you to have a loving relationship back and forth. You have to have that communication. Uh, you can go to a million marriage seminars and you could sit in the back and play on your phone and as long as you heard the word communication, I don't care how many days the seminar lasts, you got it. That's what you do with a, your spouse. You have to communicate, okay? Communication. How many of you in here are married or have been married and say your husband or your wife has a problem with you and you say, what's wrong, honey? And she goes, nothing. Well, what is it? Is it something I did? No, nothing. <laughs> I hear some giggles out here. Well, if it's something that I did wrong or whatever, can you just tell me what it is? No, it's nothing. Okay, is that communicating? No, that's not communicating. Will you, will you eventually find out what it is? I guarantee you, you will. <laughs> Something about don't let the sun go down on your anger. Yeah, that, that, that thing. Yeah, you'll find out. I had a friend, uh, I don't want to get off track too much, but he was married many years and, and he told me one time, he said, I got coat hangers for my wife for our uh, what's it, anniversary or Christmas. I said, coat hangers. He said, yeah, you know, those real fancy wooden ones. I said, let me get this straight. You bought your wife coat hangers. He goes, yeah, that's what she wanted. I said, no, she doesn't. She does not want coat hangers. Those are for the house, you idiot, you know. But he's going, no, she won't. Oh, boy, you got a lot to learn. Uh, so communication, it's huge. Guys, don't ever buy your wives coat hangers okay do yourself a favor trust me it'll cost you a whole lot more in the long run <laughs> okay all right so it begins and ends with prayer if you are going to have a loving relationship with the Lord you have to pray you have to communicate your heart and soul pray in this two-way communication with God as the Holy Spirit in you and dwelling you as the vehicle for that communication. Your mind, through knowledge of Him and His Word, can meditate on the Lord throughout the day. Okay? That's what's known as walking in the Spirit. Okay? When God wants you to walk in the Spirit, that's what He's talking about. You, you hear things like, well, I'm supposed to pray all day every day. Well, you can be on your knees all day every day, but you can't get your work done at work or whatever, so... Walk in the Spirit. It's much easier. Meditate on the Lord throughout the day, okay, whenever you get a chance. Uh, God already knows your thoughts, right? Some people say, God already knows your thoughts. I don't need to pray. Uh, no. God wants you to bring it to Him. He wants you to always bring whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be a laundry list of things that you want God to do. It can be, somebody told me in here last week, they like to pray prayers of thanksgiving, Oh, that's awesome. That was you, wasn't it, Debbie? Yeah, prayers of thanksgiving. That is awesome. You can spend, if you try to just focus a little bit on the things that God does in your life every day, of every, every minute of every day, you can spend an hour easy on just prayers of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Lord, for that. That's awesome. God wants to hear that from you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So, how do you cast all your cares on him? How do you do it? Through prayer. This is the first commandment Jesus spoke of, and he wants us to make this a life pattern. This is a life pattern. This is not something you get up here on Sunday morning and you pray for a little while. No, this, this is throughout the week. You go through the whole week, every week, prayer. Anything that comes up, pray, pray, pray. I guarantee you it'll change your life. I've told you guys this before because I, I preach here once a year. I think I preached in August last year, so I'm ahead of schedule. You might get me early next year. Uh, but I had a friend that wouldn't even work on his old Chevy truck without, without praying first. He says, I'm not raising the hood on that old truck until I pray <laughs> because it was always broken down. So pray, okay? 
What's the second commandment Jesus spoke? Remember, Jesus spoke this. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, just let's, let's dissect that a little bit. Love your neighbor as yourself. Already there's an assumption there that you love yourself. Do you? The assumption is that you love yourself and you're supposed to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So do you love yourself? Some people are going, well, maybe, some days, not so much other days. No, you're to love others as you love yourself. So let me, let me, let me break that down a little bit for you. This is self-love, what we're talking about, loving yourself. But it's not this arrogant, boastful, prideful type love. Look at me, how great I am, you know. No, that's none of that. No, what kind of self-love is he talking about in this scripture? What kind of, of love is he talking about? He's talking about value type of love. You have great value in God's eyes. God didn't make a mistake creating you, okay? You have this tremendous value in God's eyes. He loves you with an agape love, an unconditional love. Agape is unconditional love that God has for his children. That's an amazing thing, okay? He has that kind of love for you. So you have tremendous value in God's eyes, and his eyes are the only ones that count. If somebody else tells you, I don't like you because of this, this, and this, their opinion doesn't count. It doesn't count. You already have tremendous value in God's eyes. I don't care who you are. Just the fact that he created you and made no mistake, you have value, tremendous value. That's the self-love I'm talking about. You have to have that before you can love somebody else. You can't love somebody else, love your neighbor as yourself if you don't like yourself, okay? So you have to have that first. All right. He created me. He knew me before I was born. He didn't make a mistake. And you have tremendous value. Does that mean you're better than others? No, not at all. Does that mean others are better than you? No, they're not. What is that? That kind of puts us all on an equal playing field, doesn't it? You're not better than them. They're not better than you. And each and every one of them, all humans God created have value. Don't miss that, okay? Don't miss that. So how do we go about fulfilling this second greatest commandment, loving our neighbor? Let's define the love that we're talking about. Is this an emotional love, this agape love? No. Is this a kissy face, huggy, huggy, emotional type love that we're talking about? No, not at all. No. Don't get that in your mind that it's some emotion because this love that I'm talking about is a love that is an action verb. Okay, it's something you do. It's not an emotion. Agape love is not an emotion. Okay? Agape was used by Christians to express the unconditional love of God for his children. That's what it is. Okay? Is it performance-based? No. Does God love you because you do certain things? No. Does he love you any less because you do certain things? No. It's unconditional. You can't earn it. He gives you unconditional love right where you're at this day without earning it. It's not performance-based. If it was, how would any of us be saved? Because he reached down to us in the middle of our sin and our sinfulness wasn't because we had everything figured out. No. God reached down in the middle of that and he brought us to himself. Okay? Through the cross. So it's not performance based. It's not a preconceived notion of how we think somebody should act before we love them. That's not it. Okay? It's not, I'll love you if you change, or I'll love you if you let me control you. No, God gives you free will, remember? Free will. That's a great thing, isn't it? 
So none of those types of love that have things attached to them are not what we're talking about when we say love one another or love your neighbor. You love them as they are just like God loves you. Love them as they are. Okay. Who is your neighbor? It can be your husband, your wife, your family, your kids, your grandkids, other people that you meet on the street. We're to have agape love for others. If you go through the scripture, and I was just blown away when I was looking at these, some of these verses. If you use the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Gateway Bible or whatever on the internet, and you look at every scripture passage, especially in the New Testament where God or one of uh, the disciples writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says to love your neighbor, it's whew, this huge list. Love your neighbor, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. I say this again, love your neighbor, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. I mean, it's repeated. I can't tell you. I didn't count them up, but it's a lot. So you would think that that's kind of important for us to do while we're here on this earth, right? This type of love is explained in this way by, uh, this is just another Christian, to will the good of another. So basically, you want the best for your neighbor, even if it's cost you something, okay? You want the best for that other person, even if it's costly to you, if it's sacrificial, okay? So to love somebody else the way Jesus is talking about here, you have to love them with unconditional love, all right? Just like God loves you. And you express this love in action. It's an action verb, okay? Uh, remember the Good Samaritan. Y'all know the story of the Good Samaritan. He comes across the guy that's beat up. He bandages him up and he takes him, puts him on the donkey and takes him into the Hotel 6 or whatever it is and puts him up for the night, a couple nights, says if it's going to cost more than this, uh, just let me know when I come back through and I'll pay the difference. And why did he do that? He didn't know that guy. He didn't know him from Adam. And he was a Samaritan, which was pretty despised in those days. Uh, because people didn't understand this scripture, right? Uh, no, that's, that's sacrificial. That cost that guy something to do that. You know, he missed a couple of days of work. He uh, probably got a lot of uh, flack from people around him, like, what are you doing that for, you know? Uh, but anytime you love like Jesus wants us to love, love our neighbor, uh, that's going to happen, okay? But that's real love. Doing what you can do to make something happen for somebody else that's a good thing that may cost you something okay uh, and you have no expectations of anything in return a lot of relationships now somebody wants something in return every time you do something nice for them or vice versa oh well, I did this for you so you need to do this for me no that's not how it works okay so keep in mind it's not conditional it's unconditional. Okay. Now here's the hard part. And you, not, you guys knew this was coming. Here's the hard part. And it's hard for me. It's not just hard for you guys, but it's hard for me. When it comes to loving your neighbor, you just don't like everybody. Okay? Everybody you just don't like. Some people you just don't like. But the scripture says that you have to give them unconditional love. But what if you don't like them? Does that count? It counts even more if you show unconditional love for somebody you don't like, okay? What is their reaction usually? If, if, if you've ever done that, showed condition, unconditional love for somebody you don't like, they're like, what'd you do that for? Well, because I love you, man. No, I mean, really, what'd you do that for? <laughs> you, you know? Okay, so as a believer with the indwelling Holy Spirit, the only way that you can love and demonstrate unconditional love for somebody that you don't like is through the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Remember I said walk in the Spirit daily. All right. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For both to will and to work 
for his good pleasure. All right. So who's doing it? God's doing it. Yeah. Through the Holy Spirit that indwells you. God is doing this. He's giving you the desire to love somebody. And he's giving you the enabling to love somebody. Does that make sense? He gives you the desire and the enabling. He would, God would not call you to unconditionally love somebody if he did not equip you to do it. So you're already equipped. You have no excuse to not love others. Would Jesus give you a commandment that you, that you couldn't possibly fulfill other than when we go back to the law and all that stuff uh, before uh, the cross? But would he give you something and then say, well, I'm not going to equip you to do this? No. No, of course you're equipped for it. All right. So we're here on this earth. We've got a long laundry list of two things that we need to be about. Okay? And we need to be doing that. We need to do that. Okay. Now, when you hear people say, and this, this comes from the Christian community, well, I pray a lot, and I know God's got a call on my life, but I just don't know what that call is. Well, have you started with the basics? Have you started with love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself? How are you doing with that first? How are you doing with that? Once you get that going... I'm sure God's got no problem revealing what your calling is on this earth, okay? He's not silent. He'll let you know what it is. But we need to be about the basics. We need to start with the fundamentals. These are the fundamentals Jesus gave us. He said, do these two things. You're here on this earth. Be about that, okay? <clears throat> None of you guys are going to be saying to me anymore, I just don't know what my calling is. <laughs> I can hear it already. All right. Fulfilling the two greatest commandments. You notice something interesting? If you just focus on those two things, that by default, it covers all of the other Ten Commandments. If you can do that, all the other Ten Commandments are taken care of. And the reason I know is because... Romans 13, verse 9. Paul wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you got all the other bases covered. If you can just get this, just get this, okay? Okay, Jesus said to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you will have this desire to please God in everything you do. Are you going to mess up? Are you going to mess this up? Sure you will. You say, no, I won't. No, you will. I, I do it. You're going to mess it up. You're not going to get it right some days, okay? And you're going to get way off track, and you're going to get in all this kind of sinfulness sometimes, but... God's already taken care of that on the cross. He's going to bring you back. He loves you. He won't let you, get, he won't let you stay out there, okay? He won't let you stay out there. You, he'll bring you back. You belong to him, okay? Now we're going to look at the character of God just a little bit so we can bring these things together. It's difficult. Our human nature dictates this. It's difficult to say we love God or or exhibit love for God if we blame God for every tragedy or everything in our life that happens all these events that happen in our life that oh man this is no good this is no fun I hate this I hate this life I hate this I can't stand this and we blame God because God's allowing this to happen God's allowing this to happen to me and I'm one of his faithful servants boy you can just hear it you know okay Let's unpack this a little bit. First thing is, it has nothing to do with God's love for you. All right? If you're going through tragedy and all this junk is happening in your life, it has nothing to do with God's love for you. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
Okay? You have to get past this kind of thinking. Otherwise, the very next thing that happens to you that may look bad on the surface, you're going to say, well, why is God allowing me to go through all of this? He must not love me. No, that has nothing to do with it. All right? So what do we as Christians do sometimes? Everything that's bad, we blame it on Satan, right? Oh, boy, Satan. Well, his, his mission to steal, kill, and destroy, he's busy about it every minute of every day. We know that as believers. And he desires no good thing for you. But everything that happens to you that's not such a great thing that puts you in tribulation or, or it's a, is a trial for you, all of that we can't blame on Satan. Yes, he has his share of things that he tortures us with, guaranteed. And we can pray against that. That's another sermon. Uh, but sometimes God allows you to walk through just misery. Your life is just pure misery. And God's allowing it. And you go, why in the world, if he loves me, am I going through all of this junk? Well, his love for you doesn't have anything to do with these circumstances. His love for you, remember, is unconditional, right? So he still loves you. That hasn't changed. If he's walking you through something that you don't like, if you look at the scripture, it's to mold you and make you into the image of his son. Now, how do you mold something without putting it through the fire? A lot of times our lives are, man, we're put through the fire. But he's molding you and making you into the image of his son. If, if you're an 80, 90-year-old person and you've lived through a ton of stuff and God's carried you through it to the other side, you can sit at that person's feet and hear wisdom beyond, unimaginable wisdom because they've been there, they've been through it, they've experienced what you've experienced. And they know that God is always faithful. Always. Don't ever forget that. And he always, always loves you. All right. So he's shaping you. That's what this is. All right. Every time in history when Israel, if you look in the Old Testament, it happens over and over and over again. Every time Israel messed up and they fell into sin, every time God would do something about it. And it was not comfortable at all for the Israelites. It wasn't comfortable at all. I pull an example, just to give you an example, uh, that nothing that happens to you as a believer is meaningless. God does this on purpose. This is happening because God wants it to happen, okay? In Israel, uh, there was a time before the Babylonian invasion that the Israelites had a habit. In fact, this was Judah prior to them being Israel. This was Judah. They had a habit of uh, false god worship, idol worship. They had gods like Moloch. Well, Moloch, which was a false god, demanded that you sacrifice your children, pass them through the fire, and this, is, this just is incomprehensible. But they would pass their children through the fire and sacrifice them on the altar of Moloch. Okay, this was, this was God's chosen people doing this. Okay, so what do you think God's reaction to that's going to be? You know, obviously something has to happen here and you're not going to get these people to quit worshiping these idols by saying don't do that anymore stop it because they've been doing it for generations already and it's enough and so look at Jeremiah 32 they set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it they built the high places of Baal what is that false worship in the valley of the son of Hinnon to offer up their sons and daughters to Moloch this is God speaking. Though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Okay, now here's what God's going to do. Verse 36. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city 
of which you say it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Okay, so what did God do about it? He had them destroyed. He took a remnant because he said he wouldn't ever completely destroy his people. Had them shipped off into uh, Babylonian captivity. All right, now put yourself in one of those families during that time. What do you see? You can't look back in retrospect and see that God's punishing them for a reason. All you see is your Uncle Joe getting slaughtered and your Aunt Susie over here, you know, they're carrying her away in chains with hooks in her nose to Babylon. And you're going, golly, God doesn't love me anymore. You know, why would God do this? Well, we have the luxury of looking back. And we can see that God did it because of their sinfulness and them passing their kids to the fire. Let's just assume for an example that God did nothing. How many generations of children would have been passed through the fire? They would have not stopped. God had to stop it. So you see, our perspective on things is not omniscient like God. He's all-knowing. He knows already. So when he looks at our life, he goes, I know this is uncomfortable for you, but Trust me, it's for your good to grow you into what I want you to mature into, okay? We don't start out being able to handle everything on our own. God has to chastise us sometimes, and it's uncomfortable, okay? Uh, but it's for our own good. All right. Now, let me sum it up here real quick, because I know some of you have to get to Luby's. We don't have much of a window. We don't have much time to accomplish these two great commandments, okay, that, that God gave us. And you can say, how, do you, how can you say that, Nathan? Well, I read the news, and I pulled this one off the internet last week, so I'll read you part of it. I read the news, and it says, Illinois pregnant mom of three killed by detached semi-tractor trailer wheel hub that crashed into her car's windshield. Uh, she's 38-year-old mother, Melinda Cullen. This was in the news, so I'm not dumping her name. Uh, his daughter-in-law, Charles Cullen was the father-in-law, was driving home from work on I-80, Interstate 80, when a wheel hub of a semi-tractor trailer became detached and smashed into her car's windshield, Illinois police say, the 100-pound object struck Cullen at around 2.20 p.m. Tuesday near Joliet, Illinois, according to the news outlet. And she was rushed to the hospital, pronounced dead after arriving there. She was the mother of three daughters, age 15 months, 5 years old, and 8 year old. She was also pregnant and due to deliver her son in 10 days the unborn child did not survive either. 38 year old, 38 year old. What did she do wrong? Nothing. She's driving on the interstate in the middle of the afternoon, 2.20 in the afternoon. She's not out loaded after two in the morning, drunk or whatever. She's living a normal life going down the interstate and a 100-pound wheel hub comes through her windshield, the brake drum. We can't explain any of this. We don't have the capacity to explain any of this other than God allowed it. For some reason, God allowed it. Every time a child dies, we go, wow. We're at the funeral going, what does this mean? But God allowed it for some reason. We don't know, okay? Do y'all remember the, the last week, the sightseeing helicopter in New York that landed in the East River and flipped upside down? Y'all remember seeing that on the news? Five people died. The pilot was the only one that survived. Five people died, and their ages were in their 20s. I think one of them was 30. They were all in their 20s. Did they do something wrong? No, they did nothing wrong. In fact, one of them was a, a Dallas firefighter that came up there to visit his buddy in New York. 
and it showed their picture on the news and they're all smiling, taking selfies on the helicopter and they're dead that fast. They are dead and they're gone and they are in their 20s, okay? They do something wrong? No. The point I'm trying to make is you don't have a lot of time to be busy about whether you're going to fulfill these two greatest commandments or not because you don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow or the rest of this day. There's nothing in, written anywhere that says we're all going to live to 80 years old and be healthy and then drop dead on the sidewalk. No. It's obviously clear that there may not be much time. So when are we going to be about this stuff? When are we going to do it? If we don't sense an urgency now, it's not going to happen. Y'all are going to walk out of here and you're going to go to Subway or Luby's or whatever and you're going to go, oh, that was nice. Uh, but uh, I probably won't change, you know. I mean, really, it's, I'll do it next week. You know, I'll change next week. No, you won't. I was reading a book this week that uh, talks about what instigates that change in your life. What causes you to change like that? And it was interesting, and this was not even a Christian book, but what causes those life changes is near-death experiences, for one. When you have a near drowning, when you have a heart attack and you die on the table and you come back, when you walk in to get your diagnosis and the doctor says, you have a terminal cancer that's the fastest growing cancer I ever, have ever seen and you're not going to last six months. That happens to 20-year-olds. That happens to 30-year-olds, okay? So those types of people that have these near-death experience things or even people that have a child die or uh, someone really close to them die, they get a sense of that urgency. They understand that urgency and they go, I don't have any time to waste. I need to get, be about this stuff because my number could be up tomorrow and I don't want to waste my life, okay? If, I don't, I don't know how to, without having a near-death experience or whatever, uh, the only other way, I guess, and, and I looked at this too, is since you can't make yourself have a near-death experience, you can think about what it would be like, I mean really focus on what it would be like if you had two days left to live on this earth and you knew it and you're in the hospital room and you've got that, that killer cancer or whatever. And now... Imagine in your mind, who's in the room with you? You got two days. Who's in the room with you? It's probably people that you really love and that love you, okay? What are you going to say to those people? What are you going to say to them? Do you have something to tell them? I guarantee you it's not, boy, I didn't get that promotion at work. That's not going to happen. Boy, I didn't finish that project, uh, the Jones file that I was working on. That's not going to be... What's going to be important to you? People and your relationship with the Lord. What was important to Jesus? People and his relationship with his Father. That was it. That was all we have to be about. That's all we have to do. Visualize that scene in your mind and that will give you an urgency. Don't forget that. When... Did y'all see Saving Private Ryan, that movie? Did anybody see that? It's about a 10-year-old movie. There's a Captain Miller played by Tom Hanks at the end of the movie. He's, he's sent, it's World War II, he's an Army Ranger captain. His, his mission is to save Private Ryan, whose four brothers have already been killed in combat. And he's supposed to go rescue him because they don't want a fifth Ryan losing his life. At the end of the movie, Tom Hanks and his entire platoon are near wiped out. And Hanks has taken a fatal injury, but he's bleeding out. But he's, he's rescued Ryan. They've rescued Private Ryan. And he tells Ryan at the end of the movie, he said, when he's with his dying breath, he says, earn it. He says, earn it, meaning make your life count for something. Make it count. 
do these two greatest commandments that Jesus gave you to do while you're on this earth. Make your life count. Make it count for something. Let's pray.